Hello, welcome to Daily Closest The Brief with me, your host, Marcos Molitzis. This is a brand new show. This is the inaugural edition of the, uh, of the brief. And what we're trying to do here is make you smarter about politics, make you the smartest person in the room. Because what we do is we go beneath the headlines, dig into what's really happening in our country and find ways that you, a patriot, can be a better, can work towards a more progressive America. So the format of the show is going to be pretty simple. We're going to start off with reading some headlines, some uh, whether they're they're trending, uh, popular headlines on, on information that's happening at Daily Coast, or could also be stuff that I personally find interesting. We're going to look at those. And after that, I'm going to bring in a guest to go more in depth about a specific single topic. Today, that special guest will be Daily Coast political director, David Neer. And we will talk about what we can do to uh, get rid of Mitch McConnell as Senate majority leader, get the Republicans out of there and have a unified democratic government to finally get some real progressive politics uh, enacted in this country. So without further ado, uh, let's get started with this week's uh, headlines. And I'm going to start with uh, Mark Sumner. Uh, we say at Daily Coast that reading Daily Coast is like reading the news weeks or months in advance. And Mark Sumner definitely personifies that when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic. He was writing about this virus in this city of Wuhan, China, back in January. So if you were reading Daily Coast back then, you would have had a heads up about what was coming up in this country. And you would have been better prepared. And many of you who do read Daily Coast were better prepared because what Mark Sumner was writing about has all come to pass. So uh, Mark Sumner, headline, Dr. Fauci warned in advance that someone needed to tell Trump that you can't drink bleach. Now, obviously the biggest news of the last week probably is Donald Trump saying that maybe it might be a good idea to inject Clorox or shine a bright light inside you. There's only two ways <laughs> that you could possibly shine a light inside. And I wonder what Trump was thinking, or maybe I don't want to think about what Trump was thinking. But we've all talked about Trump's idiocy on that quite a bit. But the real, this, some of you may not know that people in the White House knew Trump was going to be, uh, was going to misunderstand a briefing he got on how to disinfect surfaces. And apparently one of those people was Dr. Fauci. And this is uh, Mark Sumner writing. Really, people should understand that Trump has never used a disinfectant, never swiped a cleaning cloth, and never even contemplated whether a load of laundry needs a shot of bleach. These things are all new to him. They're exotic. It shouldn't be surprising that Donald Trump had to be given a briefing on how to clean a countertop or that he had no understanding of the chemicals involved. After all, he's not a plain old fool. He's a rich fool. If you've ever wondered why there were warning levels on the side of consumer products, the answer appears to be Donald Trump. Next headline, Kentucky's gravy train is now in danger thanks to Mitch McConnell's heartless greed. That's by me. So I, I wrote, as of 48 hours ago, few people knew that Kentucky was the nation's leading recipient of federal largesse and certainly had no clue just how much the state of Kentucky received compared to the rest of the country. Then Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, started whining about blue state bailouts and the shit has hit the fan. So it's what's happened. Republicans are pretending and they always have that they're the independent ones, right? They're the frontiersmen. They pull themselves up by the, uh, by the bootstraps. Reality is exactly the opposite. It is democratic states, blue states that are supporting the rest of the nation. It is cities supporting rural conservative areas. I mean, if it was up to the free market, those rural areas would not have telephone, they would not have internet, they would not have mail service, they would not have a lot of the things that they have because people in blue states, in blue cities, are funding those things. And it turns out that New York has paid $116 billion more to the federal government than it received since 2015. 
On the other side, Kentucky took $148 billion more from the federal government than it gave. So the next time you hear Mitch McConnell complain about the deficit, we can all say Kentucky first. The next time that Mitch McConnell complains about federal disaster relief, we can say, Kentucky, you don't get any more. But we are the United States of America. We're all supposed to look out for each other. If Republicans can be, and conservatives, if they can be uh, properly, um, respectfully, uh, uh, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, if they can, if they can be, if they can show gratitude for the help that they are provided to by those blue cities, blue states, that would be okay. But that's not what they do. Uh, our final headline, as youth death toll nears 60,000, and I think by the time you see this, we'll be over 60,000, Tucker Carlson says COVID-19 isn't nearly as deadly as we thought. This is by Walter Einenkel. And he says, Quote, while social distancing policies have been somewhat effective at mitigating the spread and intensity of COVID-19, according to Tucker Carlson, quote, it's not likely, it's likely not because of the lockdown. The virus isn't nearly as deadly as we thought. You know, this has been a problem from the beginning. There is a clear partisan divide between conservatives and liberals on how seriously the virus is uh uh, has to be taken, and, and Fox News has led that right-wing dismissal of COVID-19 and the deadliness and the steps we need to make to mitigate the effects. And, and the reasons are probably pretty simple, is obviously shutting down the economy has repercussions to people's job situation. And if people don't have jobs, historically, people don't re-elect incumbents. So by all indications, Republicans are putting their the health of their supporters and of Americans in general ahead of uh, uh, or behind their own electoral needs, their electoral uh, chances. And it doesn't have to be that way. We've seen in state after state that governors that have taken tough steps to deal with the crisis have sky high approval ratings. This is not a normal year. Trump could be just as electable with a crappy economy if he did what was needed to do to mitigate the effects of this pandemic. Instead, the United States leads the world in deaths, in cases, in every horrible metric. And when we talk about USA being first, this is not one of those times that we wanna be ahead of the rest of the world. So anyway, without further ado, we're going to bring the inaugural guest for Daily Causes the Brief. He is David Neer. He is the political director. He is in charge of Daily Causes down ballot elections coverage, that is, Senate, House, state based coverage, local elections, that sort of thing. And he's also in charge of our endorsement program. Daily Coast funnels tens of millions of dollars to progressive causes and candidates every year as we do our part as a community engages to make this a more progressive uh, country. So David, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Marcos. It is a pleasure to be on the very first edition of The Brief. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's we got a lot more of these to go. So I want to talk the U.S. Senate and what chances we have. So the first question I have is, before the coronavirus hit, at the start of this year, what did the Senate picture look like? The Senate picture at the start of this year, pre-pandemic, as you were saying, was one where Democrats had a narrow but very difficult path back to the majority. The Senate, as we know, favors small states. Small states tend to be rural and very red. It is an anti-majoritarian institution, and Democrats are always facing a difficult time when they're fighting on that battlefield. So the good news, though, is that Republicans are defending far more seats than Democrats, and there are a number of seats that are vulnerable. But I would have said that a few months ago, Republicans would be the narrow favorites to hold the Senate and for Mitch McConnell, of course, to remain as majority leader. Now, I think that that picture has reversed itself. 
And so what states were always sort of on the map? What was what was the original battleground? So Democrats need to pick up three seats. They need to net three seats in order to take control of the Senate. And I say three because in a 50-50 tie, if Joe Biden is the president, then whoever he picks for his vice president can break ties in the Senate. If Joe Biden can't beat Trump, it's very unlikely that Democrats can take back the Senate. So we'll start there. From that perspective, the seat we have to sort of worry about most is Alabama. Doug Jones is a fantastic senator, but unfortunately, he's very likely to lose re-election this year. So that starts Democrats down one. So that means Democrats really need to pick up four seats, assuming Jones loses. And to get to your question, the top two on the list are Colorado, which has really moved far to the left in recent years, in large part because of the high education levels there. And then after that, Arizona, these are uh, that's another state that's also trended towards Democrats recently. And those were the two most vulnerable Republican incumbents, Cory Gardner in Colorado, Martha McSally, who, of course, lost a Senate race in 2018, uh, running again now as the appointed senator in Arizona. Those were the two where Democrats felt the best. Now the playing field has widened. Yeah, so let's talk about how that has widened. And I'm, I'm curious if it's the coronavirus itself that has widened that or if there are other factors that are expanding that playing field. I think that is the question we as analysts are going to grapple with for a long time. I am not surprised to see the races in North Carolina, where Tom Tillis is the vulnerable Republican coming up for re-election, and Maine where Susan Collins is running for another term. And of course, she's notorious among progressives. I'm not surprised to see those seats come online in the way they have. In both of those cases, polls recently have shown Democrats extremely competitive, often ahead by a few points. And it may well be that these races would have gotten more competitive even without the coronavirus. But Trump's absolute bumbling, Republicans being tied to someone, as you were saying earlier, who has, uh, you know, his popularity hasn't decreased that much. But uh, like you were saying, the governors in these states, their popularity has soared. So Trump can't even do the basics right. He already was not very popular and they're stuck with him. And, you know, they've signed up to join the Bleach Injection Caucus and <laughs> they've been pretty happy there. <laughs> All right. So we've got Arizona. Uh, Colorado, Maine, North Carolina as her four top pickup opportunities. We are likely to lose Alabama. So that nets us a plus three if Joe Biden wins the White House. We have the tie-breaking vote. What does that picture look beyond that? I mean, there's a second tier, correct? Absolutely. And that second tier of Senate seats, that's a set of seats that could really come into play because of what the coronavirus is doing to the political environment. So let's talk about what those seats are. There are not one, but two Senate races taking place in Georgia this year. Georgia, of course, is a state that Democrats have wanted to compete in for a very long time. We came extremely close in a governor's race in 2018 with Stacey Abrams. And if the trends continue, again, with these uh, well-educated affluent suburbs moving away from the Republican Party, if that outstrips sort of the rural areas moving toward Trump and the GOP, then those two Georgia seats can definitely be in play. There's also Iowa. Iowa is uh, a state that's heavily rural and moved away from Democrats in 2016, but moved back toward us somewhat in 2018. There, Republican Joni Ernst is running for re-election. And one interesting thing there is we have seen outside groups reserve millions and millions of dollars on both sides in Iowa, which I wasn't expecting. And that suggests that even Republicans are a bit worried about that seat. And then one other that we have to talk about is Montana, where Democrats landed their uh, top possible recruit in Governor Steve Bullock, who's term limited. Of course, his presidential campaign didn't go as he wanted, but as a Senate candidate, he really is the best we can hope for there because we know he's won even when he's been on the ballot with Trump. Now, progressives are spending a lot of, are sending a lot of money to two favorite uh, candidates in states in Kentucky against Mitch McConnell and Texas. Uh, are, is that a good idea to be, you know, sending money to those candidates? So Texas, where John Cornyn is up for re-election, uh, I think that is definitely a long shot. 
but and we're still waiting to uh, nominate a candidate there. The primary is unresolved. But that is a state we saw Beto O'Rourke come within just three points in 2018. And Democrats have to at least try to compete there because there are many other races down the ballot. And if Republicans have to sweat Texas even a little bit, that's good news for us and bad news for them. Now, as far as Kentucky, that is a much, much harder target. I completely understand why so many progressives are so excited about trying to beat Mitch McConnell and why they flooded his main opponent, uh, Amy McGrath, with, with tens of millions of dollars in money. And I have no problem with that. Even if McConnell almost certainly can't be beaten, he's pinned down. And every day he has to spend worrying about his own election and raising money for himself takes him off the campaign trail outside of D.C. And he can't help the rest of his caucus, who's more vulnerable. And I'll also add, like I was saying with Iowa, the outside groups, including Republicans, have made big ad reservations here. So, you know, maybe they're just playing it super, super safe, but they shouldn't even have to spend a penny on McConnell. Right. I, I think a lot of people think that this money is is either or. If it goes to Amy McGrath, it's not going to go to Joe Biden. It's not going to go to, uh, uh, you know, up in Maine or some of the quote more winnable races. But it's not. And if it gets people excited about being engaged, uh, I th actually think that's a good thing. I think it's a fantastic thing. And our friends at Act Blue, which is the, of course, giant hub for progressive donations, they keep stats on uh, donors, especially first time donors. And first time donors very often become second and third time donors to other candidates. So if you bring someone into the political process who's excited about beating Mitch McConnell and donates in the Kentucky Senate race, well, now they have an account on Act Blue. And that makes it easier for them to donate to the next race, whether that's Maine or North Carolina or further down ballot. So it's a great way, like you said, to excite people and bring them into the political process. Oh, that's, a, that's a great point. I didn't even thought about that. So thanks for bringing it up. So here's uh, maybe a fun question. We've talked about all these candidates, all these states that are in play. Some of them are longer shots. Some of them aren't. If you had to guarantee, if you could guarantee victory in one of those states, which one would you choose? That is such an interesting question. And I am actually going to pick Steve Bullock in Montana. And the reason why I say that is not because I'm a Bullock stan, though I do <laughs> like him and he's certainly been a good governor. But because Montana is such a red state that if you can take a small state that Trump won by 20 points and lock a Democratic senator in there for six years, that's an opportunity you don't want to give up. Because God forbid we should lose in North Carolina this year. We can win in North Carolina in 2022 and 2026. In Montana, that's a lot harder. But... Once you do get on the door in Montana, Democratic incumbents have done a really good job of getting reelected. Just look at John Tester's career. He's the other senator from Montana. So I would go with Steve Bullock. Am I allowed to ask you who you would pick? Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think you're absolutely right on the merits. 100% um, agree on the merits. But um, instead of saying I agree with you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Maine because I just Susan Collins has, has pretended to be this moderate, maverick, uh, Republican, but really independent in what is a, essentially a blue state. And she's gotten away with it election after election after election. And finally, after her vote on Kavanaugh and her vote to acquit Donald Trump on impeachment charges, finally that facade has been ripped off. And so we had this great chance to finally put an end to one of the biggest charades in our current politics and have somebody who actually honestly reflects the state of Maine. So my my brain is with you, David. My heart is up in Maine. <laughs> so. I, I, I can't say I disagree with you on that. <laughs> All right. So uh, we have a real chance to win the Senate. And it, it's apparently it's getting better by the day. So what can progressives do to hasten the demise of Mitch McConnell and improve our chances to win the Senate. So I'd like to suggest two things. Marcos, as you were saying earlier, my team manages our down ballot elections coverage at Daily Coast, which really means every single race out there other than the presidential race. And we, of course, have a very close focus on the Senate. 
Every day we put out a free newsletter at eight in the morning Eastern time. It's called the Morning Digest. And if you want to stay up to date on all of the key developments and all of the key Senate races, you really got to sign up for it. Thousands and thousands of activists, campaign operatives, journalists all read it. You can sign up at dailycoast.com slash morning digest. And uh, I don't want to talk only about arming our readers with knowledge. I want to direct them to a tool to actually really get directly involved. And one of the things that we have done all cycle long, in fact, before the cycle started with the Kavanaugh um, confirmation that you were referring to earlier, we have been raising money in all of these potentially competitive Senate races, even in races where we don't have a nominee yet, using something that ActBlue calls a nominee fund. You can donate now. The money will be held in escrow until a Democratic candidate wins the primary in each state. And then they get that money all in one fell swoop. And it's a real shot in the arm after a primary. In fact, in Maine, we're going to see our nominee get millions of dollars in nominee funds. It's going to, I think, really put a scare into Republicans. You can donate to our nominee funds. And also we've endorsed one Senate candidate so far, Cal Cunningham in North Carolina. And we will include that link in this webcast. Yeah, all this, all the links are in the with the show notes, which are in the sort of the, the segment description below this video on YouTube. And uh, like I said, we used the nominee fund in 2018 and it was a huge success in, in that year, which turned out to be a, a wave year, correct? It was a major success. That was really the first time that we ever had. And what wound up happening was Democrats would run in these competitive primaries. They ordinarily would be left kind of broke in a lot of them because, you know, you got to leave it all on the playing field if you're hoping to win your party's nomination. But instead of starting from scratch at zero, they might get 100,000, 200,000 or more that they would then be able to turn into more money. So it really is something also that I should emphasize. The GOP has nothing like this. They are light years behind on our fundraising infrastructure. So there is no Republican equivalent of the nominee funds. So we always get an advantage from them and, and they've been awesome for us. David, thank you so much for your time. Hugely appreciated. Always so informative. Uh, listeners and viewers, read Daily Co's elections, sign up to the newsletter. You will be the smartest person in any room where people are, are discussing politics. I promise you. So that is today's show. Thank you very much. See you all next week. Bye-bye.